Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome all to our event on the topic of pandemics, China, and the coronavirus with our guest speaker, John Barry. Our event this evening inaugurates a spring series of events at St. Olaf College on the larger theme of U.S.-China relations. So keep your eye peeled for uh, news items uh, advertising those events as they unfold. My name is Edmund Santuri. I'm a professor at St. Olaf and Morrison Family Director of the College's Institute for Freedom and Community, the institute sponsoring our event this evening and the spring series on U.S.-China relations just noted. The purpose of St. Olaf's Institute for Freedom and Community is to stimulate and support free inquiry and meaningful debate of important political and social issues among students, faculty, staff, and the larger public by exploring diverse ideas about politics, markets, and society. The Institute aims to challenge presuppositions, question easier, comfortable answers, and foster constructive civil dialogue among those with differing values and contending points of view. For help in organizing our event, very special thanks go to the excellent staff of the Institute, Administrative Assistant Don Bartz and Assistant Director Eric Grell, whom you've just met. Without their intelligence and energy, nothing happens. Thanks also to Molly Work and Carrie Vanderveen of St. Olaf Marketing and Communications and to Jeff O'Donnell and his broadcast media services crew for their splendid contributions. Thanks also to St. Olaf students for helping us this evening. A.D. Bantz, Phoebe Carey, Brita Gallagher, Salim Hachel, Finn Johnson, Meredith Maloli, and Maxwell Rubin. Finally, thanks to students and faculty of the biology, nursing, philosophy, and statistics programs at the college for inter integrating their courses of study with this event uh, this evening. As noted, our speaker tonight is John M. Berry, a resident of New Orleans. Berry is currently a faculty member at the Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine and distinguished scholar at Tulane University's Bywater Institute. He is an award-winning and New York Times best-selling author whose books have involved him in two areas of policy making related to social preparedness for social emergencies. His book, The Great Influenza, The Story of the Deadliest Pandemic in History, is a 2004 study of the 1918 pandemic and was named by the National Academies of Sciences the year's outstanding science book. A member of the original team that recommended public health strategies to mitigate a pandemic, he worked on the issue directly with the Bush and Obama administrations, as well as with the Department of Health and Human Services, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, various national security entities, and state and local health departments. The Society of American Historians named his earlier book, Rising Tide, The Great Mississippi Flood of 1927, as the year's best book on American history in 1998. And the New York Public Library named that book as one of the 50 most memorable books of the preceding 50 years. After Hurricane Katrina, Louisiana's congressional delegation asked Barry to chair a bipartisan working group on flood protection, and he served for six years on both the Louisiana Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, responsible for statewide hurricane protection, and Southeast Louisiana Flood Protection Authority East, overseeing three levy districts in Metro New Orleans, where he was chief architect of its lawsuit against 97 oil companies for their role in coastal land loss. There are a lot of other things we might say about John Barry's distinguished career. Some of those accomplishments are noted uh, in the program that you have tonight. Just one other biographical tidbit this one more personal in character. In high school, over a half century ago, I played football. I was an offensive and defensive tackle. So what, you will ask? Well, John M. Barry, yes, this very John M. Barry with us tonight was my line coach. In those days, the mid to late 1960s, he was an undergraduate at Brown University who coached part-time our classical high school football team in Providence, Rhode Island. I must confess that John Barry was a better coach than I was a lineman. 
and he went on to become an assistant coach on a couple of major Division I college football teams. The details are he here are a story for another time, but my history with Barry may help to explain how we were able to get this national authority on pandemics here so quickly after the initial break of the coronavirus. I suspect he may still feel he owed me one. After all those brutal lineman drills, he ran us through way back there then in the 1960s. Absolutely merciless. Thank you, John Barry, for that contribution to my education. At any rate, in a Washington Post article he published a month ago, John Barry stipulated then, and somewhat ominously, that the current coronavirus probably could not be contained. But that was a month ago, and as we all likely sensed over the last few weeks, this particular disease, now named COVID-19, has been something of a moving target for analysis, prediction, and social preparation. Thus, we should be interested especially in hearing what this national authority on pandemics has to say now about COVID-19, one month after his Washington Post article was published. In anticipation then, would you all join me in welcoming John M. Barry to speak on pandemics, China, and the coronavirus. We were just talking about some three-on-one drills we used to do when he was playing defense, and he told me that I told him once, well, why don't you ever do that in a game? So and after that, he actually tried in a game. He said he made a tackle. Uh, but Ed actually was a uh, tenacious and intense tackle, and I would put him up against Joey Bosa today, and I'd kick Bosa's ass. <laughs> Now that laugh is probably the only time tonight you're going to laugh. Uh, I'm going to talk about pandemics, China, and coronavirus in that order. I actually do what the uh, title said. So I'll give you some overall background first. Uh, you could define a pandemic as an infectious disease that spreads widely over multiple continents. It pretty much always involves something new. That would be either a new pathogen, a change in a pathogen, or a new environment. And what happens in a pandemic is a function of two things. The interplay between the infectious agent and the host, the individual, and simultaneously an interplay between the disease and the society. You know, there have been pandemics about as far back as recorded history goes. There is the so-called Plague of Athens, which actually was a plague throughout Asia Minor, probably typhoid, though we're not certain. It killed about two-thirds of the city of Athens and several million throughout Asia Minor. Uh, there was the Antonine Plague in 165 to 180 AD, killed maybe 10% of the Roman Empire, uh, which at that time stretched from Spain all the way across to Asia. It was probably smallpox, may have been measles, possibly something else, we're not certain. Then you have the plague of Justinian, a couple, several hundred years later, which was bubonic plague. Then of course you've got the Black Death, bubonic plague, and public health and medicine today can deal with these older pandemics, the bacterial ones. In fact, smallpox has been eliminated. And indeed, a guy named D.A. Henderson, who was in charge of eliminating smallpox for the World Health Organization, was a good friend of mine. He died a couple of years ago. Anyway, sanitation and therapy can take care of typhoid and cholera, the plague. And that leaves us with modern pandemic threats, which are viruses. So you can ask yourself, what is a virus? They're kind of interesting. Back in the 1860s, 
when Pasteur was developing the germ theory of disease, there was actually an alternative, quite sophisticated theory. Uh, it was, chemistry was much more advanced than bi biology back then, and there was a chemical theory of disease that a chemical chain reaction would be set off, and that's what was causing what, in fact, was infectious disease. And, in fact, 20 years ago, a Nobel Prize was given for prions, which is exactly that process, a chemical reaction. But viruses fit that theory as well. They're not alive. They don't consume energy. They don't excrete waste. They don't have any kind of sexual activity. They can't reproduce independently. They have to, as you probably know, take over the f internal functions of a cell that they invade. Uh, most virologists think that viruses devolved. They had been more complex. They got simpler and simpler. And they, as I said, they need to infect the cell to and hijack that cell's reproduction capacity. You get a new pathogen, and you have a threatened pandemic. You know, as I said, it could be a change pathogen. There could be environmental changes. There could be an entirely new pathogen that's created. By a change pathogen, uh, something like antibiotic resistance would be one example of that. If that became really widespread, you would have some serious threats from bacterial diseases. By environment, I could mean something like, I do mean something like climate change, which could expose people to diseases like dengue and malaria in parts of the world where normally they are, like Minnesota, for example, where you don't get a lot of malaria up here. Um, but by environment, I also mean a new environment for the pathogen itself. In this case, I'm talking about an animal pathogen which jumps to humans, jumps species. Uh, HIV would be the best example of that in your lifetimes uh, prior to the moment. Now, this threat of uh, pathogen jumping species has increased dramatically recently because of development as humans have invaded the wild, particularly uh, the Amazon and Africa, parts of Southeast Asia. So humans have been exposed to new pathogens, to animal pathogens, in ways that they hadn't been before, or at least in ways that could spread that they hadn't been before, because if you're in a really isolated place, you're exposed to a pathogen, even if you die, it's not going to spread outside because of the isolation. So the environment here is what you are offering the virus, a new possibility of expanding into the human population. Lastly, as I said, a new pathogen could be created. This would bring us to influenza and back to modern pandemic. Demics. Tom Frieden, who was the former CDC director, was asked what kept him up at night, what gave him nightmares, and he said, influenza, it's always the worst case scenario, although conceivably we could be facing something worse than that now. Uh, it's a very rapidly mutating virus. It's an RNA virus. All RNA viruses rapidly mutate. When a single influenza virus inflates a single cell, it will produce between 100,000 and a million replicas of that virus. Every one of them will be different. But the reproduction process is so flawed, 99% of those particles will be incapable of functioning. They will be incapable of invading another cell. So you can see that every possible permutation of that virus will be produced, and if it happens to come into contact with another species, bingo, if the, if the permutation that can infect the other species comes in contact with the other species, then you, you have a new pathogen in another species. Uh, but there's another route through which influenza can, can change. It's called reassortment. Most 
organisms, including viruses, have their genetic information on a single continuous strand. But influenza is different. Influenza has what's called a segmented genome. There are eight different segments that carry the virus's genetic information. If you get two influenza viruses invading a single cell, they can swap these segments, just like if you take two decks of cards and shuffle them together and create a new virus. When that happens, this reassortment happens, you can create all sorts of new possibilities. The natural reservoir for influenza viruses is birds, but it can infect pretty much all warm-blooded creatures, cats, dogs, tigers, moose, horses, seals, and pigs. Pigs are generally considered a particular problem because they have receptors on their cells for both bird viruses and human viruses. So that's where you could see an easy mix of two different viruses infecting the cell. You get a new virus that's capable of jumping in species, but it could happen in, in another mammal as well. Now, influenza viruses are named according to two antigens, two things that stick out on the surface of the cell, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase, H and N. And there are, I, you've got 18 hemagglutinins, 11 neuraminidases, so you've got H1, H2, H3, N1, N2, N3, the re, and the virus, as I said earlier, has eight gene segments. In 1918, we had a very, very lethal pandemic. Seven of those eight segments came straight from birds. One segment seems to have been from a mammal, although not necessarily a pig. And what made 1918 lethal and what is dangerous about the coronavirus, most influenza viruses will only bind to cells in the upper respiratory tract, which is also the case for the coronaviruses that cause common colds. The 1918 virus was capable of binding to cells not only in the upper respiratory tract, which made it easily transmissible be between people, just as a common cold is, but also to cells very deep in the lung, which meant you might start out with viral pneumonia. Common cold coronaviruses cannot bind to cells in the lung. This coronavirus can bind to cells in the lung. So again, the upper respiratory tract makes it easily transmissible. The lower respiratory tract makes it potentially lethal. Uh, the so-called bird flu viruses that you've heard about in the last decade or so and that were threats to cause pandemics. Viruses H5N1, H7N9 that have 40 to 60 percent mortality rates, they could only bind to cells in the lung. So again, you're starting out with a serious disease if you get sick at all. They did not bind to cells in the upper respiratory tract, so they could not transmit easily between people. So. I want to give you a quick rundown of five pandemics in the last hundred years or so. The first, of course, I just started to talk about, that's 1918. The symptoms mimicked typhoid, cholera, dengue. If you don't know anything about dengue, its nickname is breakbone fever, which gives you a sense of the symptoms. People could bleed not only from their nose or mouth, but from their eyes and ears which is pretty frightening. People could die in 24 hours or less after the first symptoms, although most lived longer. Uh, it killed between 50 and 100 million people in a world population of less than uh, one quarter of today's. If you adjust for population, that would be about 225 to 450 million people today. Most deaths were actually bacterial pneumonia but by no means all of them. And the bacterial pneumonias were made more serious by what the virus had already done to the lung. Give you a more intimate sense of what this was like, 
I'll read you a letter that a uh, doctor in one army camp hospital wrote to a colleague. And just so you know, when I use the word cyanosis, cyanosis is a technical term from when you turn blue, essentially, from lack of oxygen. These men start with what appears to be an ordinary attack of influenza. But when brought to the hospital, they very rapidly develop the most vicious type of pneumonia that has ever been seen. A few hours after admission, you can begin to see the cyanosis extending from their ears and spreading all over the face until it is hard to distinguish the colored men from the white. It is only a matter of a few hours then until death comes. Pneumonia means in about all cases death. We've been averaging about 100 deaths per day. It takes special trains to carry away the dead. For several days there were no coffins and the bodies piled up something fierce. It bet, beats any sight they ever had in France after a battle. Goodbye, old pal. God be with you till we meet again. Now I said that the course of a pandemic is a function of the pathogen itself, the disease, and how the society responds to that disease. We were at war, and the Wilson administration made a conscious decision to lie, not only about the pandemic, but about everything. Uh, the national, national public health officials were saying the so-called Spanish influenza, in fact, it was called Spanish influenza because Spain was not at war. When they got sick, its media wrote about the disease, whereas the warring companies, countries, didn't write about it. They were censored. So it did not start in Spain, but it was known as Spanish influenza. Anyway, national public health leader said the so-called Spanish influenza is just old-fashioned grip. Another national leader said it's ordinary influenza by another name. These lies were very alienating. People understood when their neighbor dies in less than 24 hours with horrific symptoms, this is not ordinary influenza by another name. The result was, to quote somebody who is living through it, the fear was so great that people were actually afraid to leave their homes. It completely destroy, destroyed all family and community life. You couldn't play with your playmates, your classmates, your neighbors. You had no school life. You had no church life. You had nothing. People were afraid to kiss one another. They were afraid to eat with one another. You were constantly afraid. You were quarantined is what you were by constant fear. It got so bad that uh, a gentleman named Victor Vaughn, a serious scientist who had been dean of the University of Michigan Medical School before the war and headed communicable diseases for the Army during the war, said, if the current rate of acceleration continues for a few more weeks, civilization could easily disappear from the face of the earth. I was, he was not given to overstatement. Coming out of 1918, and, you know, as, as Ed said, I was very involved in some of the preparedness efforts and planning in the last 15 years. You know, the number one lesson coming out of 1918 in terms of handling a pandemic is to tell the truth. You do not want to happen in society what happened in 1918. And, in fact, there is even almost a perfect control that you could use in, in 1918 while a lot of cities were having the panic, such as I just described, because they were lied to. In San Francisco, the mayor, the city council, business leaders and labor leaders all jointly signed and uh, this statement, which was a full page in the newspaper, huge type, that said, wear a mask and save your life. Now, the mask actually didn't do any good, but that was a very, very different message than this is ordinary influenza by another name. You have nothing to worry about. And San Francisco functioned probably better than any other city in the country. In other cities, people were literally starving to death because others were afraid to bring them food 
Nothing like that happened in San Francisco. Uh, and sort of in as an aside, I want to uh, say in 1918, humans gave influenza to pigs. That's pretty clear. It wasn't the other way around. The so-called human flu went to sl uh, swine, not swine flu. Okay, it's not clear where the 1918 virus crossed into humans. The leading hypothesis is China, but it is by no means proven. There are another hypothesis, in fact, one I advanced in my book, but I've actually backed away from uh, myself since a lot of scientific work has occurred since my book came out, and I, my hypothesis was, was Western Kansas. Uh, and I had good evidence, but as I say, I'm backing away from it now. It's still barely alive, not completely disproved, but I think China's more likely. Then the second pandemic of the century, the so-called Asian flu, began in central China in 1956. Nobody knew about it until it hit Hong Kong a few months later in 1957, spread rapidly around the world. That was the so-called H2N2 virus, the number two hemagglutinin, and number two neuraminidase. The virus could bind to the lung, but it rarely did. In the United States, it killed about 70,000 people in a population roughly one half of today's. Uh, and it actually had one beneficial effect. The international community began to worry about the return of another influenza pandemic, and they started looking at surveillance, not only of influenza, but other emerging pathogens. You next have the third pandemic, 1968. This is H3N2, so-called Hong Kong flu again. It's not clear that it started in Hong Kong, but it did start in China. It was first recognized in Hong Kong. In those days, you could get very, very little information from, a, from any, any area of inquiry, including public health from China. So we really don't know what was going on internally in China in either 57 or 68. This was much uh, less of a threat, killed about 35,000 Americans, still adjusted for population, a fairly good number and still caused plenty of disease, sickness, hospitalizations, lost work, and so forth, economic impact. The funny thing is that although in 1957 and 1968, a lot of the people alive had been alive in 1918. Particularly in 1957, if you were 20 years old, then, you know, 40 years later, you're 60, you should have a pretty good memory of that. Yet neither the 1957 pandemic nor the 1968 pandemic excited anything like the attention that we're giving right now, or for that matter, when the so-called bird flu influenced. And about that time, the Surgeon General of the United States supposedly said, quote, it is time to close the book on infectious disease and declare the war against pestilence one, unquote. Now, I didn't name the Surgeon General because the reality is he never said that. But the reason I quoted it, and it is an urban myth, the reason I quoted it is, is because it does, in fact, reflect the, a general feeling about infectious disease about, at that time. It was sort of the peak of antibiotics before antibiotic resistance, really. Uh, anyone started taking it seriously. And there was this general feeling that infectious disease was something of the past. Then came the fourth pandemic of the century, HIV. This woke people up. You know, so far there are uh, about 36 million deaths, roughly the same number of people living with HIV. People continue to be affected, infected. Uh, there are drug-resistant infections out there. That's a, a growing threat. But for the first time in decades, people began to worry about an infectious disease. HIV got everybody to pay attention. You jump to 1997, 
and the first bird flu virus surfaced, H5N1. I guess a lot of you weren't alive at, in 97. Uh, there were only 18 people infected. It killed six of them. In Hong Kong, however, they, it came from birds. In Hong Kong, they slaughtered millions of birds to try to contain that outbreak and make sure that it never occurred again. And they cleaned up all the wet markets and so forth. And by now, the international community was taking very, very, very seriously the threat of another pandemic from an infectious disease. And they thought it would be most likely influenza. And this surveillance system is really what picked up and the preparedness that was coming out of that is what picked up SARS, which emerged in 2002 in China. China said nothing about it for a month. In fact, the uh, one doctor who tried to blow the whistle was uh, detained by the military for uh, almost two months. But when news of that eventually escaped China, you know, it's very possible that without the surveillance that people had started to put in place for influenza, they might not have picked up SARS for more months, and it might have been too late. At any rate, you know, we were able to contain SARS. SARS is a coronavirus, uh, but it's very different from this one, chiefly because you were not infectious until you were really sick. So you were not walking around mixing with other people. You were flat on your back when you were most contagious. So most of the people who died from SARS were healthcare workers. Roughly 90% of the transmission of SARS was in hospitals. So that disease was able to be contained and all but eliminated from the human population. Then the next year, right after SARS, H5N1 resurfaces again in China. And since then, there have been almost 900 cases, and about 60% of them have died. If that virus ever gains the ability to, I mean, all of those cases, or almost all of them, some, a couple of them were from very close contact between people in the same family, but almost, with the exception of two or three of them, they all came directly from dealing with birds. If the virus ever got the ability to transmit between humans, very potentially dangerous for obvious reasons. So H5N1 is out there, 2004, 2005. People are getting very, very scared about it, and they start investing a lot of money, a lot of money in preparedness. The uh, US government passed a bill billions of dollars in the Bush administration. Then in 2009, we have the fifth pandemic of the century. Another four of them have been influenza. This was the so-called H1N1. That was the same, 1918 was an H1N1 virus. And it, the 2009 virus also could infect the upper respiratory tract and deep in the lung. But as you can see, 2009 was not a very serious outbreak. It was serious if you died. It was almost like two entirely different diseases. It didn't always infect the lower respiratory tract. But the people who did, where it did infect there, it was like 1918. But the overwhelming majority of infections were mild even for influenza. Worldwide, where there, there were probably about 300,000 deaths, maybe a little bit more than that. The dangerous thing about it was that the average age of the people it killed in, in 1918, usually influenza kills only the elderly and the very, very young. In 1918, the average age was 28. That was the or median, that was the deadliest age, was, was 28. Very unusual for influenza, and it was almost identical in 2009. 
So that's the fifth end pandemic. That began possibly in Mexico and may actually have begun in San Diego, more likely Mexico, but there's some evidence for San Diego. It was called so-called swine flu. And uh, worldwide, there was a very irrational response to this threat. Hopefully, we'll do better this time. Uh, perhaps because of HIV or perhaps because of fears over Ebola, the world was more, much more sensitive to infectious disease in 57 or 68. The Chinese health minister called the pandemic a foreign disease and promised to keep it out of China. They tried very hard. They imposed at the border the same kind of controls that they are imposing internally right now. Now, a China, the China has a group they call the CDC. The Chinese CDC later did a study that concluded even if isolation and detected, detection had been 100% effective, or nearly 100% effective, the epidemic in China would have been delayed by four days. Not much. 208 million Chinese ended up being infected. This is by the disease that the Chinese health minister promised to keep out of China. And that year, during the 60th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic, health authorities covered up H1N1 fatalities and stopped updating any disease information until the celebration was over. But I don't want to pick on China. There were plenty of others acting irrational. France wanted the European Union to cancel all flights to Mexico. There were calls to close the United States border with Mexico, you know, which was nuts. This was after it was already in San Diego and New York City. I mean, totally irrational. Uh, Brazil kept information from its own people, uh, particularly in southern states, and they had the highest mortality in the world. Egypt slaughtered every pig in the, company, in the country. Uh, if you're Islamic, you don't eat pigs. The only Coptic Christians ate pigs, so they were politically showing the populace they were taking action. And only a tiny sliver of the population was actually affected, so it was a good political move. Uh, even the CDC overreacted a little bit. On a Friday, they issued a recommendation that if there was a single case in a school, that school should close for two weeks. And uh, the D.A. Henderson, whom I mentioned earlier, the guy who uh, rid the world of smallpox or was in charge of the effort, you know, I remember he called me up and asked me what I thought about that. And I told him he, I agreed that it wasn't a wise idea. D.A. had a lot of stroke. And uh, on Monday, this was a Friday, they issued the recommendation. He went to the White House. On Monday, they rescinded the re recommendation. Uh, anyway, the end result in Mexico, the actual cost was $180 million. The economic hit on Mexico was $9 billion. Not exactly a helpful message to other countries to be transparent about a disease that's brewing inside their company and, and country. And in fact, Mexico is extremely transparent in letting information out. So. Now let's talk about China. 1918 may have started in China. 57 and 68 did start in China. And 97 H5N1 surfaced in China. In 2002, SARS erupted in China. In 2003, H5N1 returns in China, although it did spread elsewhere in the world. Then in 2013, there's another influenza virus, H7N9 which has been exclusively, or pretty exclusively in China. There have been about 1,600 cases, about 30% case mortality. That's a lot. And again, like H5N1, there's a threat that that could cause a lethal, very lethal human pandemic. There are, and I could recite some other uh, viruses that are lesser threats, but real threats. And then now in 2019, in December, coronavirus also in China. So you have to ask, why China? Partly, it's a coincidence. 
You got 1.4 billion people, and it's not like the only viruses that emerge in, and threaten humans are in China. H1N1 was either the U.S. or Mexico. HIV is Africa, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, another coronavirus. Jump from camels to people in, in the Middle East. Zika was first identified in Africa, but the first outbreak among humans widespread is Brazil. So China is hardly alone. Nonetheless, China's culture does create specific vulnerabilities. As I said earlier, the natural reservoir for all influenza viruses are birds and particularly waterfowl. A quarter of the world's chickens, two-thirds of the world's domesticated ducks, and almost 90% of the world's domesticated geese are in China, and they're raised in close proximity to both pigs and humans. China used to have half of the world's pig population, but about two years ago, I said used to, two years ago, an African swine fever epidemic has, has you know, really ravaged the Chinese uh, swine production. It's killed roughly half the population of the pigs in China, largely because of mismanagement. So why is this? Well, there are two main reasons. One is the wet markets, and the other is the uh, affinity of the Chinese uh, for eating wild animals. There's something about the wet markets that, that uh, Chinese like, but they're extremely unsanitary. You have cages with different live animals, chickens, ducks, civet, you know, they're defecating on one another. They're butchered on boards with the same knives. There's blood flows down gutters, mixes with water, gets all over. Uh, a large city probably has several hundred wet markets. The Chinese government at one point tried and failed to convert many of the wet markets to supermarkets. Uh, at the same time, some Chinese municipal governments were actually supporting the development of new wet markets because it's a source of fresh produce and meats and part of the urban lifestyle. Now, today, in most wet markets, there are no, li no more live animals, largely because of the H5N1 threats and, and SARS. But it, you can still find them. And people seem to want to see the animal that they're going to take home and eat. They want to see it slaughtered. Uh, I don't present myself as an expert on China, but there was a column in the New York Times that I would recommend to you about Chinese eating habits that ran last week. Uh, you could uh, search in, in about the Chinese eating culture and the word Jinbu, J-I-N-B-U, you could Google that. It reads, relates to the desire among the Chinese to eat wildlife. There was a photo that circulated about two weeks ago in Chinese social media that showed the catalog of a single store with 50 different kinds of wild animals that it's spell, sold, 50 different species. And it's no question that wet markets played a role in H5N1 and probably H7N9 it was not the original, so, well, it may have been the original source of the coronavirus outbreak, but that, I, I know it's been blamed initially for, you know, that single market where all those original cases seem to have come from. Actually, we've now traced it back. There were cases before those first cases came from. We don't know where those actual original cases started from. It could have been a wet market, but we don't know that. The one that has been blamed initially really just amplified the outbreak. That may not have been the original source. Now, a few days ago, China outlawed uh, the wild animal trade, but it's not at all unclear. It's not at all clear whether that will be a permanent uh, change. If so, 
it would be a major help in keeping further pandemics, further emerging pathogens from jumping species. So to recap, there are three reasons why China is a source of pandemic threats. One is pure randomness, just the number of people. So you could distribute evenly around the world and China's got its share. The second is the proximity of different species in terms of influenza particularly uh, together and back to influenza again, then you're talking about pigs and the mixing bowl concept. And the third is the wet markets and the wild animal trade. So let's talk about how China's performed in the face of pandemic threats. Obviously, the context is an authoritarian society. Now, most people in all, bio all bureaucracies and all governments dislike disclosing bad news. In autocratic regimes, you can run into serious difficulties and even threaten your life by telling an uncomfortable truth. In China, probably the most dramatic example of that has nothing to do with pandemics, but the Great Famine from 1959 to 1961, which was caused almost entirely by government policy and the cowardice of its own bureaucrats, and it killed an estimated 30 to 40 million Chinese. They starved to death, even though there was plenty of grain in the warehouses. But they had a distribution problem, and they would have had to admit all sorts of mistakes. Instead, 30 to 40 million people starved to death. And to this day, the Chinese government does not allow the truth about that famine out there. Uh, and I would say that to those who say that the government today is threatened by its, what's going on right now with the coronavirus, you know, remember not only Tiananmen Square, but also the Great Famine. Obviously, Mao's government survived the Great Famine untouched, uh, despite what was happening in the country. Anyway. Fast forward to today's China, it's a lot closer to telling the truth than it was back then, but there are similar internal party pressures are operating, even if they're less intense. There's a substantial difference in degree, but not in kind. So we shift to health care. Up until the summer of 2002, China denied that HIV had epidemic potential in China. It preferred to place all blame outside for, on outside forces. In SARS, the government hid the outbreak and, in fact, threatened the health of the world. Even once the disease became known, it delayed entry to international experts and only a intense international outcry complaining about cover-ups, you know, when that happened, China finally opened its borders to scrutiny, but even then it was monitoring and controlling the fashion in which people looked at what was going on. The criticism China suffered during SARS did in fact make changes, some of them quite significant. And China built an extensive system, built up its public health infrastructure, its internal CDC. A lot of this was actually funded by the United States government and helped along by U.S. experts. Uh, in 2004 alone, the year after SARS, the U.S. government gave, spent $34 million helping China upgrade medical research, epidemiology, and things like that. When the first human case of H5N1 surfaced in late October 2005, China was much more transparent, and I, I'm, that was earlier than late October 2005. When the first human case of H5N1 surfaced, China was much more transparent than it had been with SARS and was 
much more cooperative with the world scientific community. But in October 2005, you know, and, and they also, in, you know, invited outside experts to come to China and so forth and so on. But the lessons learned from SARS by the Ministry of Health did not reach its own Ministry of Agriculture. These are, remember, bird viruses jumping to people. They are in commercial flocks being raised, but they're not monitoring the animals and what they do learn about the animals they are not telling the world about. The Ministry of Agriculture would not cooperate with the inter international community, it refused to share samples not only with international bodies, but it wouldn't even share samples with the Chinese Ministry of Health, it claimed it was not a human health issue, but that it was a trade issue. As a result, human cases of H5N1 are being, and remember this is killing 60% of the people infected, hundreds of people. Human cases, all of which came from contact with birds, are being discovered before any reports of any bird viruses in birds. If you'd been monitoring the flocks, you know that's a threat and you can take care of it in those birds but they weren't doing that. Now, I talked earlier about the foolishness of their reaction in 2009 during that pandemic. So in two, four years later, 2013, another influenza virus, 1,600 cases, 25 to 30% case mortality. Initially, China was transparent and cooperative, but there were still some difficulties. And then as the trade war has developed in very recent years, since the Trump administration came in, China actually has gone backwards in terms of cooperation on some of these viruses. Uh, they started withholding samples of the virus less than two years ago. And in some elements of the Chinese government apparently still did not see this as a health issue. They still saw it as part of a trade package, as part of a negotiations with the Trump administration. Something we wanted, therefore they were going to withhold it. Now we come to the reason I'm here, the coronavirus. We have lots of experience with subtypes of this virus. The coronaviruses cause 25% of common colds. SARS was a coronavirus, MERS was a coronavirus, MERS also you need very close contact for transmission. Many of those cases uh, were transmitted uh, in hospitals. Uh, we have not been able to eliminate that from the human population, but it does not seem to be a threat to cause a pandemic. There are ongoing cases, but no widespread community spread. COVID-19 first appears late in 2019, in December. It's infinitely more transmissible than SARS or MERS. As I said earlier, the virus, you know, uh, is not only a respiratory, actually I didn't say this, it can be transmitted not only in normal respiratory, the way that respiratory viruses are but also in blood or fecal matter. So oral fecal transmission, like cholera or something like that, is also possible. Uh, this was not unusual. Uh, for example, SARS was spread through plumbing in an apartment building that wasn't really up to snuff in terms of a sanitation uh, standpoint. And it looks like that's partly why it spread on the cruise ship where you have over 600 cases. Uh, the, there's, when you talk about an infectious disease, you talk about a reproductive number. You've probably all heard of that. How many people one person will infect? You know, if it's a reproductive number less than one, then you won't have an epidemic. It's going to disappear. If it's over one, then it will continue to spread in a community. Seasonal influenza has a reproductive number of 
one person gives it to one and a quarter people, or let's say four people give it to five would be more accurate. The 1918 pandemic had a reproductive number of 1.8. One person gave it on average to almost two people. If you've been following the news, you know that the reproductive number for the coronavirus is over two. That is an explosive number. But the reproductive number is not inherent in the pathogen. It can be affected by the actions you take as a community. So it's the number if there are no public health measures taken. The case fatality of the coronavirus, we have no idea. We don't, the reason we have no idea is we know how many people are dying, but we have no idea how many people actually have been infected by the virus and are sick. Uh, I think it is, I did think until yesterday that it was safe to say that there were a lot of cases out there that were not counted. You know, when you hear, see the count of 80,000 or 77,000, whatever it is today, those are people who've been presented to a physician or hospital and been tested and the test confirmed the disease was there. You would normally assume that not everyone who's infected has gone to a doctor, been tested, and had a, the case confirmed. You know, could it be 10% more? Maybe. Could it be, you know, 1,000% uh, more? Maybe. The only solid number is how many die. Yesterday, however, probably the most disturbing thing that I've heard is that one of the World Health Organization experts who was finally allowed into China said he thought that there were not a lot of cases out there that had not, that, that would have been counted. If that's true, then you have a case mortality probably in the rough range of 2%. Even then, we don't know because in Hubei, Providence, it's close to 5%. In other provinces in China, it's actually under 1%. That could be a function that the healthcare system in Hubei is overwhelmed. It could be a function of the fact that in these other provinces, more people are going to die. They just haven't died yet, so they're not counted. We don't know. Uh, the only really solid number we have, other than the absolute number of deaths, is that the percentage of people who are hospitalized, sick enough to go to the hospital and be hospitalized, that's roughly close to 15%. Those die. Roughly 15% of the people hospitalized die. In influenza, if you're sick enough to go to the hospital, roughly 7 to 8% die. So that would make it double the lethality of influenza. Influenza, that's not so great. Two years ago, which was the worst influenza season of recent years in the United States, 61,000 Americans died of influenza. So, you know, that's not good. If it's double influenza, it could be worse than that. We really don't know. There are so many things we still don't know about this virus. And... Okay, I'll talk more about that later and probably have quite a few questions about the virus. Uh, how did China respond to this is probably everybody in the audience knows. Uh, the first eight doctors who tried to blow the whistle, they were detained by the military. One of them died, uh, became quite a hero in China and a lot of outrage, not only in China but around the world. But in a scientific sense, China has been extremely transparent initially. They w immediately put out all the genetic information about this virus. That's very, very, very important. And it's something that they did not do in the past. And we would not be, I mean, we're already approaching a phase one trial, which means you're testing the safety of a vaccine. We're probably in a month and a half or so, we'll be in a phase one trial on a vaccine. That could not have been possible if we didn't have the genetic information of the virus. The government took 
incredible, incredibly aggressive actions to try to control the virus. You know, some restrictions affected nearly half the population. You know, it's, uh, 50 million people locked down. China was probably the only country in the world that would have had any chance to contain the virus because of its combination of a police state with authority, incredibly high technology geared towards surveillance, towards spying on its own citizens. And I understand your next uh, uh, institute program is going to deal with a surveillance state. Uh, and they had the resources, and they had the will. So China was better situated than any country in the world to do that. You know, we might have technology here, but we don't have the spying techniques. We don't have the will. We don't have a populace that would obey these restrictions. Uh, I could give you some examples of some of the things they did, but I think I'll skip that so I'll have more time for questions. Uh, even so, internally it continues to try to manage the information in ways that, you know, for example, it's been uh, emphasizing influenza deaths in the United States, which are, you know, I think about 12 to 15,000 right now to make their situation look better. Uh, they did things like claim that a new hospital building in Wuhan, it had been constructed in 16 hours. There's no such thing. They showed a picture which, which turned out to be a stock photo of a building, you know, a couple of thousand miles away. Uh, they spent a month without allowing the World Health Organization experts in there. They finally got there a few days ago. Initially, they weren't even, when they finally agreed to let the WHO in, initially they still weren't going to let the CDC in, although they finally did allow the CDC to go in. On the good side, I, I have a close friend who is uh, a very senior uh, person at WHO. Uh, he's a conservative Republican, doesn't like China at all, doesn't trust them at all in general and yet he's convinced that they are now being transparent with the WHO. But it's too late. So we go to the future. What are we looking at right now? It's astounding how successful China has been in tamping this down, although it is still a long, long, long way from saying that it's over in China. You know, are they monitoring? There are at least 500 million rural Chinese. They're not monitoring these people that they were in urban areas. We don't know what's going on there. Uh, what happens when all this containment measures stop, when people go back to work, what's going to happen back there? But even for the sake of argument, China, who's completely successful and completely eliminates this virus in China, it's too late. Uh, you know, in 2005, there were 233 international air routes from mainland China leaving the country. By two years ago, there were 739. International air passengers exploded from 3 million to 51 million. So, in, in Korea, right now, there's significant community transmission. In Japan, there's communi community transmission right now. In Iran, there's community transmission right now. Indonesia has direct flights to Wuhan. There are thousands, if not tens of thousands, of people on a routine basis going back and forth between Indonesia and China. Indonesia has not reported a single case. Now, is that no cases or is that no surveillance and no public health system? Africa, no cases in sub-Saharan Africa. And yet the Chinese have a huge presence in those areas. 
Is there no cases or is there no surveillance? I strongly suspect there is no surveillance. So you have a significant part of the world where I think the virus is circulating right now in large measure. Today in the United States, we found the first case that can't be directly traced. We don't know where the person infected in California acquired that. I know people who have, you know, in the United States, they were not, if you presented to a doctor with the symptoms of a cold, unless you had been to China or knew someone from China, you were not being tested. So I know people who believe that it's circulating in the United States now. That may or may not be the case. Tony Fauci, whom I have high regard for, very high regard, said he think that cases, the, the likelihood of that is remote, and yet a day after he said that, we have this case in, in California. So when I wrote this a couple of days ago, I was going to say I do not believe it can be, much less will be contained, but, you know, now I think it's very clear. Um, you know, a month ago I said when I sent that thing into the Washington Post, I originally titled it, This Virus Cannot Be Contained. I changed that, softened it a little bit, and said, can this virus be contained, and said, probably not. But, you know, I was right the first time. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wish I was wrong. You know, Mark Lipsitch, a, you know, very well-regarded epidemiologist at Harvard, believes this year, 40 to 70 percent of the world population will be infected. So this is not good. Uh, on the bright side, if you're under 50 years old and you do not have some underlying disease, if you don't have something like diabetes or heart disease or if you're not obese, the chances of your dying are very, 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 very small. You know, this disease does target the elderly and people with underlying problems. Very strangely, it does not target children. That is very bizarre. I have not even heard a hypothesis explaining, that sounds rational, explaining why that is the case. But very few children have gotten sick. So the first irrational action we have seen around the world so far is Japan closing schools. If, you know, that is a, a standard tactic you take in influenza because kids get influenza and are often super spreaders of influenza. Even so, closing schools is a very controversial action. I can get into why and why not and so forth and so on. But in a severe pandemic, and I'm a pessimist on its effectiveness, but in a severe pandemic of influenza, I would absolutely close schools despite you know, potential negatives. But I wouldn't close schools if kids aren't getting sick. I mean, it, it makes no sense. Uh, let's see. In terms of economic impact, last year China produced 39% of the world's growth. You know, that's largely going to be eliminated this year and maybe conceivably if things get really bad, entirely eliminated. So the world's economic will take a huge economic hit. Short term, the supply chain disruption caused by this disease could become very, very severe. And no industry would be hit harder than healthcare. Not only is practically all your antibiotics imported from China, and those that aren't come from India, which gets its raw materials from China. But the hospital gowns, the surgical gloves, the masks, the hypodermic needles, the bottles that you get transfusions through or where they drip, the tubing, that all comes from China. So then what? Let me actually close. Let me see if I can come up with an app. 
with an optimistic note. Well, let me talk about some of the unknowns we have first, then I'll close with the optimistic note. Some of the important, uh, maybe the most important unknown regards immunity. You know, measles is, a, is an RNA virus that mutates just as fast as influenza. But if you're exposed to measles once or get vaccinated, you're immune for life. And the reason is that the part of the virus that the immune system targets doesn't change. If it changes, by coincidence, that, if that part changes, the virus doesn't work. Remember I said 99% of all the influenza particles produced can infect another cell. If the measles, part of the measles virus that the immune system targets changes, the virus won't infect. Influenza, it's the opposite. The part of the influenza virus that the vaccines target changes much or more than other parts of the virus. So influenza vaccination, you know, is only marginally effective. Some vaccines are 99% effective. Influenza in the best year on record is 62% effective. Sometimes it's only 10% effective. We don't know on the coronavirus whether the spike that sticks out from the cell and which, is you, which it uses to attach to a human cell, it seems fairly stable. So that's one reason for optimism. That is a reason for optimism. Uh, but we don't know yet whether a vaccine will work against this virus. We don't know whether natural immunity will occur. If it does, we don't know whether natural immunity will occur, will, will last for a couple of months, a couple of years, a lifetime, whatever, unlikely to be a lifetime. We do know that you can get a cold over and over and over again. A lot of those colds are going to be coronaviruses. I'm sure you've been infected more than once by a coronavirus and gotten a cold. So that's one of the questions that we have no idea of. The other is whatever number you put on the reproductive number, the so-called R naught, how many people one person can affect, that's sort of meaningless. We still don't know whether this disease would infect 1% of the population, 10% of the population. As I said, Mark Lipsitch is a modeler. He predicts 40 to 70 percent of the population. Uh, but I've worked a lot with modelers. And one thing I learned from them, and I, a quote that I love from a modeler, it may have been Mark who said it, uh, all models are wrong, some are useful. Uh, so there's reason for hope there. Uh, but the other reason why there may be some optimism is uh, there do seem to be some antiviral drugs that, that are likely to have some effect, although one of the ones that seem promising has already been abandoned in Shanghai. There was an anti-HIV uh, combination of two drugs that had worked against another coronavirus, and they, they thought it would work against this one. In Shanghai, they've already stopped administering it because it seemed to have no effect. So they, you know, hopefully the other drug, either that trial may turn out to be flawed in some way or, you know, the, any, you know they could be wrong. Uh, but there are other drugs out there that do seem to have effect. We don't know for certain yet. Uh, but that's better than the Tamiflu that works against influenza with only, at best, moderate success. So on, on that, I close and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you.
those dealing with the virus, just because with stigma, there are underreports yeah. and things like that. But um, Well, I mean, obviously, it makes no sense for someone not to go to a Chinese restaurant in the United States because of this virus. That's just stupid. Uh, you know, and in fact, WHO has been very sensitive to this, and that's why it was named COVID-19, so that, China, you know, that's a lot of politics there, so that China was not stigmatized uh, by calling it the Wuhan virus or anything like that. Uh, you know, the closest to a viral name being stigmatizing would be MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. That's the only one with a geographic uh, area. I mean, obviously, the world is in this together, uh, and the extent to which we work together, uh, you know, we'll all be much better off. So I would condemn that, uh, any, any stigmatization. So, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, it, it did make sense by the same token, I think to cancel flights to China to try to contain the disease while it seemed that there might be a chance of containing the disease. You know, frankly, I think in the near future, as this virus spreads more widely in various communities around the world, it will be time to stop that because it's already out there. You know, I mean, there are people who still think, who disagree with me, who still think or at least dream that it could be contained. Obviously, I don't think so. But if you think it can still be contained, then there's a reason to continue, uh, you know, flights and quarantines and so forth and so on. Sure. I don't want to shock anyone, but I have lived in Shanghai for 10 years, and I'm here in the United States as a refugee because of the coronavirus. Um, my son and I and our two children work for an international school in Shanghai, and our schools have all been closed. All the schools in Shanghai, and in fact, most of China are closed um, as a result of the coronavirus, and they're, um, we're, we've been doing e-learning for a month um, from afar. Um, my question is, um, when, you, when you said the why China, it scares me. I love China. I love Chinese people, I love Chinese culture, I love Chinese food. I even love the government because they get things done. Um, I wish they would stop hiding things. So my big question is, if it's often China, historically, around the world, how come it is too late for this virus and for others to come? When do we think China will get a, a hold of somehow the responsibility in the way that they produce food and consume food that it affects people in the world? Well, you know, I'm not an expert on China. You know, I know something about pandemics. Uh, what I do know about China is all in direct context to pandemics. You know, I mentioned the wet markets and live animals. That's part of Chinese culture. You know, the Chinese, I said the Chinese government actually made an effort to control wet marks, markets at some, some years ago and was unsuccessful. Uh, you know, if they make permanent and enforce, enforce bans on wild animal trade, that would be a major plus. I don't know whether they'll do that. So that's, can't do better, and I can't give you a better answer than that. I'm not really expert enough. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, I had a question about um, the spread of the virus in the United States specifically. Um, as I've followed reporting, and obviously as we've spoken about tonight, um, Ch the Chinese government has taken some pretty strong measures in their early attempts to contain the virus and, and battle with it. Um, do you have predictions for when the virus begins to spread in the US, as it seems to be imminent that it will? What sort of policy measures would be taken Sh ought to be taken, should we take any at that point, once we start see it spreading, would any sort of measures like that be logical? And what do you see coming, especially since Donald yeah. Trump seems to be um, expressing some cynicism about yeah. the CDC's well, response? 
you know, I obviously I do think it's inevitable. I made that pretty clear. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if when it first surfaced in some communities there weren't uh, some kind of quarantine measures imposed and so forth. I don't think they would do any good. Uh, but there are things that can be done. As I you know, indicated, the reproductive number can be affected. Uh, most of them involve come under the rubric of, quote, social distancing, unquote, which is a self-explanatory uh, uh, phrase. Uh, the information that applies to basically all respiratory diseases, or all infectious diseases, really, uh, that you've already heard a hundred times about things like hand washing is absolutely correct. Uh, I would add that I would, I would think one of the most dangerous places would be a public bathroom uh, because of the oral fecal possibilities. I mean, they're not possibilities. I, I don't know what percentage of diseases spread that way, but it does seem that that's one route to spread. Even flatulence actually could spread the virus. Uh, you know, that's not clearly demonstrated, but I think it's quite possible and there is evidence for that. Um, and, you know, plus people, when they go to the bathroom, they, you know, blow their nose while they're in there and, you know, throw out the towel and so forth. And, you know, to wash your hand effectively, that takes a lot of work. <laughs> not many people are actually going to properly wash their hands. Uh, you know, changing public habits on handshaking. You know, today when I was meeting people, I was hand bump, you know, fist bumping, uh, which is, you know, not something I would normally do. I was sort of making a point today. Uh, maybe I'll eventually change my habits if the disease, uh, does, when the disease arrives here. Um, but it's going to be mostly local. One of the other things we don't know, you know, influenza tends to, or at least the influenza pandemics, have entered a community at different times, it's not all simultaneously, and they've all taken roughly somewhere between eight and 12 weeks to pass through that community. And then it's gone, largely. That's another thing we don't know about this. You know, is it going to be behave like a pandemic influenza virus, go through a community, burn through the fuel the people who are subject to infection or, and, and then move on, and then again, how do you develop immunity, and if so, for how long? You know, I don't know. Or is it just going to hang around indefinitely forever and ever? You know, I do think once it's in the human population, which it is, uh, we're going to be facing this not only this year, but next year and the year after that and for the rest of your lives. Uh, there is a reasonable possibility of getting a vaccine that's effective. So that would be the hope. And, you know, so I hope I've answered your question. But it'd be primarily local. You know, again, unless you can demonstrate that kids are spreading the disease, it makes no sense to close schools. Uh, if you're sick, stay home. I'm not a believer that masks do you any good, but if you're sick, and you put a mask on. They actually knew that in 1918. They demonstrated that uh, experimentally. Uh, they were pretty good scientists in 1918. They didn't know what we knew, but they were very, very good scientists. I mean, there's one figure in my book, a minor figure. He won a Nobel Prize in 1966 for work he did in 1911. You know, he was pretty far ahead of his time. Uh, so, the again, the, on the masks, you know, uh, I wouldn't, I don't, won't wear one, you know, unless I get sick. If you're sick, stay home. That's a real thing that you could do to protect a community. And it runs foreign to the American idea, and probably not just American, of toughing it out. They need me at work. I'm going to go in and I'm going to do it. You know, it's not like being on the football field and playing through an injury if you can perform and you're just suffering pain. You can play through pain. You're, you're going to make your colleagues sick. Stay home. Yeah, way back up there. <laughs>
Uh, is there any merit to the, the virus not surviving in warm temperatures? Well, there's some merit. I mean, we don't know that about this virus as a fact. And it's going to survive. It's just not survived as long. You know, if, I mean, influ you can get an influenza in the middle of the summer, but it's less likely for two reasons. The virus survives less often outside the body in warm temperatures and high humidity than it does in cold temperatures and low humidity, but it still can survive. Uh, the other thing is, during the summer, you're more likely to be outside at, you know, at a baseball game versus inside at a hockey game. Uh, so there's a difference there in terms of what you're doing. Uh, so there's a good chance it could tamp down when the weather gets warm, but it's warm weather is not going to completely kill it off. And then you have the southern hemisphere, when it's warm up here, it's cold down there. So the virus would be more likely to be circulating down there and then recirculate up here when it gets cold again. So that's a temporary fix, even if it, even, even if it does apply to this virus, which we do not know for sure at this point. So given a pandemic, um, in terms of a best case scenario, what does that look like for containment and what are the differences here? Okay, a best case scenario would be a low infective rate and a low mortality rate. So that's pretty obvious. Uh, you could have figured that out yourself. So in terms of predicting what the best case scenario is, which may have been more what your question was. I can't speculate. I, you know, I just have no idea. So I said, you know, Lipsitch is not the only epidemiologist who has predicted something like 40 to 70 percent of the population gets sick. You know, if that's the case, even if the mortality rate is 0.1 percent, which it tends to be for seasonal influenza, you're still getting, you know, <laughs> roughly. 10, a little more than 10% of the American population gets sick from seasonal influenza during a given year. So the virulence of the virus varies year to year. The effectiveness of the vaccine varies year to year. Our worst year recently, 61,000 Americans died. That's all in, you know, that's a lot. <laughs> You know, so that might be a best case, but I don't really know. And, the, you know, if 40% of the population instead of 10% of the population are getting sick, and you multiply that number times four with the same case mortality rate, that's a lot of people, you know. But, we, you know, it's speculation at this point. And how effective the drugs are going to be. Will the antivirals work? And if they do work... How fast can you make them, and how widely can you distribute them? Yeah, there's somebody way up there. Last row. Hello. Right up here. Oh. Hi. <laughs> um, so I'd like to know your professional opinion on, number one, do you think our, our local and state public health departments are ready for an influx in cases? And number two, do you think our health care system in general is ready for an influx? Well... You know, I meant to give a shout out um, at the beginning to a friend of mine, Mike Osterholm at the University of Minnesota, runs something called the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, and without a doubt is one of the leading people in the world in terms of preparedness and biodefense. And I don't know for a fact, my guess would be Minnesota is probably strongly influenced by his work. Uh, so I would guess Minnesota is probably as well off as anybody. I don't know that. Um, in terms of the health care system, you know, we're not ready. You know, nationally, we're certainly not ready, and I doubt that any local area is ready. If you look at any usual influenza season, a bad one, and you have places closing, hospitals closing emergency rooms, you know, or setting up mobile, uh, you know, putting trailers out there to treat people, uh, because they're overwhelmed. You know, the number of respir respirators 
in the United States, you know, a high percentage of them are in use routinely for one reason or another. And when you add a significant percentage on top of that, there aren't going to be respirators. Um, you can do amazing things to people whose lungs stop functioning for limited periods of time. You can take the blood outside the body, circulate it outside the body, oxygenate it, put it back in the body until the lung recovers. But how many hospitals can do that? How many beds in the hospitals are available to do that? How many patients can they do that to at the same time? How many ICU beds are there in a given hospital? You know, if you have a, you know, and earlier I talked about the fact your antibiotics, your surgical gowns, they're all, they all come from China. So, yeah, if you get a significant uptick, if you get 10% of the population sick with this disease, it's a problem. One of the things that all the social distancing measures might do if they're successful is level off. Instead of having a sharp peak of an epidemic when the, which would really overwhelm the healthcare system, it might shift the curve, flatten the curve. You may end up with the same number of people getting exposed and sick, but over a much longer period of time so your healthcare system can do it. There's some very, very good data from the United States Army in 1918, which was never published. And in fact, I didn't put it in my book because it was too technical. Uh, but I've used it and, you know, since I've gotten involved in the preparedness stuff. Uh, there were 120 Army camps in the United States. Some of them were as many as 60,000 troops. 99 of those camps imposed isolation and quarantine. 21 did not. And they would inspect, the camps that imposed isolation and quarantine would inspect soldiers, many of them, twice a day. If they had any symptom, they were isolated immediately. If the unit they were in had two soldiers with symptoms, that unit was quarantined. There was no difference in morbidity, the number of people who got sick, or mortality, the number of people who died, between the camps that imposed quarantine and isolation and the camps that did not. And I'm not saying there was not a statistically significant difference. I'm saying there was no difference in morbidity and mortality. But the camps that rigidly imposed, and only those that were rigid, in, rigidly enforced these measures, they did slow down the transmission significantly so that there was, you know, a much lower strain, less of, of a strain on that camp's health care system. However, if even in the Army, in a military base, in the middle of a war, you couldn't, and most camps didn't do this effectively. They didn't enforce it stringently enough. If they can't do that in the military in a war, how are you going to do that in a civilian community in the peace? It's difficult. So, yeah, this guy right here. You better make it a good question, you. <laughs> you. <laughs> Is it a good question? <laughs> Uh, I was just curious about uh, whether or not uh, certain factors such as uh, the uh, higher cost of uh, health care in the United States and uh, the uh, increased presence uh, of, uh, of uh, fringe anti-vaxxer movements might make the United States more vulnerable uh, to the epidemic uh, than other countries. Well, I mean, that is a good question, but it's a bad one to end on because I can't really answer it. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think the anti-vaxxers are going to be drowned out. Everybody is going to want a vaccine. There's going to be a huge demand for vaccine, and nobody's going to pay attention to the anti-vaxxers. In terms of, you know, I don't think the cost, you know, I'm not an expert on the healthcare system, but I don't think people presenting at a, an ER with this stuff are, are going to be turned away. Uh, you know, it may affect the profits of a lot of the corporations that run a lot of hospitals, 
uh, and and I hope that I'm correct, but you know I, I think they will probably be treated. And most of this treatment is is not that expensive necessarily. You know, a lot of it. I mean, remember the overwhelming majority, even even if the mortality case mortality is two percent, which would be enormously high if you're infecting even 10% of the population, much less 30, 40, 50% of the population, you still have 98% of the people who, you know, are, you know, most of them are, have essentially the common cold. And a significant number get pretty sick, but recover 100%. Uh, so I guess that's optimistic. Thank you. Please, re please remember to fill out the comment card and turn it in if you can. Thank you. <laughs>